More than 125,000 Instagram users follow Corinne Stoko for deals on high-end fashion. But as her blog Mint Arrow has grown in popularity, Stoko has also become known as someone who frequently shares her faith as well as inspiring messages. In 2018, Stoko and her husband Neil, who is also her business partner, opened up about another large part of their life finding healing, hope, and recovery from pornography addiction. The success of Corinne and Neil Stoko's blog and brand, Mitt Arrow, has been featured by Forbes, Business Insider, Adweek, and Allure. They recently launched a podcast hosted by Corinne called Mitt Arrow Messages. Additionally, they have been involved in helping the church's missionary and media departments with digital missionary work initiatives over the past several years. They are the parents of three daughters. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I'm so grateful to have Neil and Corinne Stoko with me today. Neil and Corinne, welcome. Thank you. We're excited Thanks, to be Morgan. here. First of all, thank you, because I know that this is something that is personal and you have been so gracious in being open with your story. And I feel like it will help so many people. So thank you. I feel like it already has. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us on. We're excited for the opportunity to be here. Neil, when did you, let's kind of go back in time. When did you first come in contact with pornography? Um, I was probably about, I want to say five years old. So um, kindergartenish age. So I, I came across, this was before the days of the internet. So I actually, it, it was a magazine that I came across. And I think I, I remember it very clearly, um, just the curiosity and then also just a lot of shame with it. Like I just, I, I'm like, this just does, this just doesn't feel right. Right. So yeah, I was, I was about five, I would say. One of my favorite like exercises in life, this is kind of a weird thing that I like to do, but I like to think like if I could go back in time to my younger self, like what would I say to myself? And so for you, Neil, when you, if you could go back to that little boy that first encountered pornography, what would you do differently? How would you think differently? And what would be kind of your suggestion to young boys that are encountering a bit? Because now it's rampant. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's a great question. I mean, back then, I mean, this would have been like late 80s, early 90s, you know, when I was at first exposed. And there wasn't a lot of talk at that time about, hey, well, here's what you do, or or even really, I think the obviously the, the problem was out there. I mean, if you go back, there's church talks and things that talk about it, but I it wasn't really a topic that was coming up a lot, especially at that age for me. So thinking about that, one of the most powerful things that I think I could have done and going back I would have done would have been to talk to my parents. Ironically, that's like the last thing you feel like doing because of the shame. Like you see something, it, you just you just want to isolate and you want to turn away and like turn inward and not tell anybody about it and keep it a secret. But that's the very thing for me that I found that drove problems and drove the addiction. So I think I would have talked to my parents and been able to hopefully establish some type of a, an understanding of like, Hey, this is, this is what that is. This is, you know, real life, you know, women, this isn't accurate. This isn't how they're depicted. This is, this is depicting them in a very negative, you know, kind of demeaning way and, and help to me to understand and, and separate that out. So I think that's probably the most powerful thing that I could have done that I, that I didn't is have that communication and, and be open with my, my parents about it or someone in, in a position of trust that would have understood how to explain that to me. Yeah. Well, I just listened to your podcast, Mint Arrow Messages, and your interview about good pictures, bad pictures. And I yeah. think if for those who are listening that are parents that are wondering how to talk to your kids and facilitate conversation about this, that's a tremendous resource. So thank you guys for doing that. The church has also come out with an amazing video. It's a short video that's not intended for like group settings or for in church, but it says, you know, show this at home to your children. We've shown that to our kids a couple of times, and it does a great job 
of showing kids this is what bad pictures look like and feel like. I mean, it doesn't show them an actual picture, but it just explains to them, here's how to identify it. Here's what to do um, in just, I don't know, maybe like two minutes. And yeah. we've used that for little family home evening lessons in our home. And that's such a great resource. So maybe you can put that in your show notes. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And your kids are are tiny. And so you do have to start so young. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that kind of takes me back a bit to think that um, our oldest right now is uh, is going to be turning seven. Wow, that's crazy! <laughs> and to think at that age, I'd already I had already been exposed to pornography, and so now seeing it through an older person, you know, an adult lens, I'm like, wow. So having something, having a plan, and being able to explain it to kids in a way that they understand, of like, hey, here's what you do. This is pornography. Um, you know, call it what it is, come and talk to me about it. And and establishing that up front, because I think we've, in my life and in, you know, the circles that I run with, with recovery, we're all, I've, I've come to the conclusion that everyone will be exposed and it's just a matter of what you do with it. So being able to communicate that to our kids is something that's super important. Yeah. Okay. So fast forward and Neil, you, did you struggle with it all through your adolescence? Yeah. So I, I, you know, it just seemed like it was always around. Um, it was like someone's older brother or someone's uncle or someone's, you know, we, there was just, was, we just kind of, it kept coming up. Um, and it was something I, you know, always, I never felt good about. Um, but off and on, I, I just, I would try and stop. I'm like, okay, I don't want to do that. Um, but then it would like come back around and it was just this pattern of, of trying to get away. Um, but, but kind of, it just kept coming up for me. And I think the first time that I actually talked to somebody about it well, was a Bishop, you know, maybe a year, a couple of years in high school, as I was trying to, you know, contemplating going on a, on a mission for, for a church. That was the first time that I mentioned it, but really it struggled all the way from, from, you know, adolescence up into, you know, up into that point and without talking to anybody about it. Yeah. And then you met the girl that you wanted to marry, Corinne. Can you tell us a little bit about how the two of you met? Yeah, we met on a Lake Powell singles trip and I was just instantly attracted to Neil. The thing that attracted me the most to him was that he was not too cool to talk about the gospel. That really was my number one thing. And it never... He never acted like, oh, that's dorky, like that's for, you know, church nerds or anything. He, We had a really open discussion about our testimonies pretty much right off the bat, and that really was so attractive to me that he was confident in his belief. Yeah. And so then obviously in any kind of relationship setting, you get to a point where you feel like you need to have a conversation about this. I guess some people don't, but some people do, and you got to this point where you felt like you needed to break up with Corinne or tell her about it. Yeah, that was kind of a decision. I'd, I'd had a pattern. It was a, it was an ongoing joke in my family. Like, oh, Neil Dates, he's, you know, can't hold on to a girlfriend for longer than three His months. His mom told me that. Like, <laughs> just so you know, he doesn't date anyone longer than three months. And I was my, like, yeah, oh, that's funny. nice. And then... That's promising. Sure enough, he dumped me at three months. And, and I think looking back, I mean, it's just like that was the, the grace period that you kind of hang back and put up the front and people thought you were great and perfect. And then, you know, at some point in the rela relationship, you start having to be, you know, open and vulnerable and all these things. And I think that that part of me was something that I, you know, just, just withheld and, and kept secret. So I, I knew that I really liked Corinne and I knew... Um, Man, I feel like I'm getting emotional here, which is that's creeping up on me. Um, but but I knew that I really loved Corinne, and and I knew that she was somebody that I could spend the rest of my life with. And so I talked to my brother at the time, who's someone that I talked to a lot about my addiction that I was open with at that point, and and he actually encouraged me. He's like, "Hey, man, you know what? Like, just just be open about it. Just lay the cards on the table, put it all on the table, and and just just be honest." And, um, I think he gave me the confidence recognizing that that was something that potentially would hold me back from getting married and, and, you know, receiving the blessings of that and being married in the temple and all these things. And so I made the decision. I'm like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll do it. And, um, 
And so that's, that's a decision that, that I made that I'm, um, to, to have that conversation with her and let her know, Hey, this is something that, that I've struggled with my whole life. Yeah. And how did that conversation go, Corinne? Well, I will never forget when y'all, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect. We went on a drive. It was right after he dumped me right before Christmas. And, um, he, Don't do that, by the way. Yeah. If you're listening. <laughs> and it's a bad idea. we sat in his car and he said, I will never forget when he looked at me and said, I have a problem with pornography. And nothing could have prepared me for him saying that. I, it's the last thing I would have expected. Um, but it was just crazy looking back that I immediately felt the Holy Ghost just come for me and tell me, you know what, it's okay. And I think he expected me to run. I think if you would have asked me how I would respond to someone like that, I probably would have told you that I would run. But the spirit just hit me and I was like, okay, you know, tell me more. And we ended up getting back together and started dating again. And and yeah, it just was, it was an immediate like piece that, you know what, it's okay that he's not perfect and that he's telling you this thing that he struggles with. And I, and I, for me, I honestly told her, I mean, we'd broken things off and, you know, there, it kind of came up like, Hey, what happened? And we had a a communication afterwards about what happened. I thought things were going great. So there was a part of me, I think a big part of me that was kind of like, okay, for closure, I'm going to tell her this and she's going to run. Um, and that's really what I fully expected her to be like, okay, yeah, thank you. I'll see you later. You know, and that, nice that was the expect, <laughs> expectation, like, hey, we'll part ways as unlikely friends. It was surprising to me when she she just sat and she listened and she listened and asked questions. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy because I thought she would be gone and just be like, all right, see you later. Really cool. I, I think that was just a really powerful experience for the both of us. Yeah. I think that's amazing because I think that that's something that now as people are trying to be more open about this, more people are having those conversations. And I think the way that you handled it, Corinne, is so spot on. But I want to talk a little bit. I can't remember if it was in your blog or your uh, podcast, but you said that there were some things you did right and some things that you did wrong before and after getting married in, in how you handled facing this challenge of pornography addiction. Can you speak to some of those things? Sure. Yeah. I think we had the best of intentions and we, you know, you're in such a desperate state when you want to overcome something. And I definitely took on that classic codependent mode of, okay, I'm going to, now I'm going to fix you. Like I'm going to take this problem and I'm going to help you and we're going to get you all better. And I mean, we did a lot of things that didn't work. Like, you know, I kind of became Neil's sponsor for a while where he would like check in with me on a regular basis. And we tried, we tried daily, we tried weekly, we tried, okay, this isn't working because it's upsetting me. Like now check in with your bishop or we did some outpatient recovery stuff that was very expensive. Neil has different feelings about it than I do, but we tried couples therapy, individual therapy, group therapy, and none of those things really worked for us. I will say that we worked closely with our bishop and he was amazing because he really, he was so hard on us that we were terrified to do anything wrong. Yeah, And we owe our temple marriage to him because we were so careful. We were so clean cut about making sure that we were prepared to go to the temple. And and I think that the day we got married, Neil and I were both in such a good place spiritually. We were going to the temple weekly together. But after we got married, you know, and I think Neil likes to say that's one of the myths is that, oh, if you have a sexual addiction or a pornography addiction, when you get married, that'll go away. And, you know, for so many like good members of the church who, who, see intimacy that way. They feel like, oh, if I can just make it there, then it will all disappear. And it doesn't because that's not how addiction works. So we had to kind of start all over again once we got married and that crept back in. And I don't know, maybe you can talk about what you think about that question, what we did right or wrong. Yeah. I think, I think what we did right is we sought help. I mean, Mm -hmm. we, we were meeting with our, I was meeting, I had been meeting with my bishop for like, two years. We had a joke. I had the thickest like stack of notes in his book. <laughs> He's like, you have the stick of, you know, and we, we both laughed about it because, but I saw that as I'm like, Hey man, like I'm willing to show up and make an effort. Like I felt good about that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, other people might 
see that differently, but like, so I think that was right. And I think, you know, the outpatient recovery program, I actually, I got a lot of great tools out of it. I got a lot of understanding about the science behind addiction, why I felt powerless that, you know, my brain had been using a, a part of my brain that had overridden the kind of the brakes of, of the brain to, to tell you not to do things that, you know, will, will get you into trouble. And, and that's why I had this feeling of powerlessness and I learned tools and different, I, I learned a lot of great things that, that were helpful, but I think the part that I was struggling with was, was working through the process of allowing the atonement to be active in my life in a way that Christ could change that, could yes. make that change. Cause only Christ, and I came to figure this out later on in recovery, only Christ can change nature, like the, the natural man. It, it's only, and we learn that through the scriptures, Mosiah 319, that's one of my favorite scriptures, um, that, that we're, you know, the natural man's an enemy to God and, and will be until I yield or we yield to the, you know, to the spirit, to Jesus Christ. And so while it was great to get tools that were helpful and to have these, you know, these different things that we were learning, that wasn't the end all be all and the change really didn't happen. And I think meeting with bishops was good, but I still was at a place where I personally, I don't think I was utilizing the atonement at the level that I needed to in order to overcome the addiction. And so that, you know, was, was a struggle for me, but, but yeah, we made a lot of mistakes. I think I relied on her, like she, like Karen was saying, you know, Hey, I'll check in with you. You'd be my sponsor. And I think it created a lot of just back and forth. We're kind of chasing our tails a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was relying on her. I'd relapse. She'd get frustrated. I'd get frustrated. I'd get resentful. You know, it creates a situation of feeling like, okay, this, you know, now this person's checking up on me and then you're getting resentful and that's driving the addiction or driving acting out more. So a lot of unhealthy things. And so it takes, I think really where the solution came was when we finally got to the point where we both went to, to ARP meetings together. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then we individually kind of started our own recoveries. Yeah. I want to come back to the addiction recovery program, and I actually want to focus a lot on that. But backing up just a little bit, I think there are probably a lot of people that will listen to this episode who either are in a relationship with someone who is struggling with an addiction or love and care about someone who's struggling with an addiction. And I think sometimes there's like, this struggle of like boundaries and also like, how do you know that it, that you should go forward with marrying someone when they've struggled with this? Corinne, can you kind of speak to one thing you've said is that you felt like you knew that Neil's heart was good. Mm -hmm. How did you kind of come to know that? Well, it's, it's definitely the exception to the rule that he came to me and was open about this before we got married. Most people they get married and then find out. Mm -hmm. So that was one um, huge factor. And I would just say that, you know, I, there's nothing as reliable as the Spirit to tell you whether something's right or wrong. Like we learn that in the gospel. We learn it in the scriptures. We learn it from the time that we're in primary. And this is one of those things that I believe Heavenly Father cares so much about what our families look like, who we decide to create that family unit with and with Neil. Like I said, from the very beginning, I knew he had a testimony of Jesus Christ. I knew that that was the most important thing to him. And even though he hadn't quite figured out how to overcome this challenge, I knew where his heart was. And when we prayed about getting married, we had a really, really powerful experience with knowing that that was the right thing. And that was something that I could never go back on. And if it hadn't been for the talk, um, Cast Not Away, Therefore Your Confidence by Elder Holland, we would not have gotten married, but because there were times when I hesitated and I got nervous and is this really the right thing? But anytime I went back to that moment where we prayed and I got an, an absolutely unquestionable yes from Heavenly Father, I knew everything was going to be okay. Even though it wasn't perfect and there were definitely years of struggle, I look back now and I'm like so grateful that I was, that I took that leap of faith with him but I think that, you know, the Spirit is the ultimate. Um, is the Spirit will never lie to you about whether somebody's heart is in the right place, whether they're pointed in the right direction. I love the quote that you shared on Facebook last night, today, um, about it doesn't matter the speed of 
you know, what direction you're going in as long as you're pointed in the right direction. And I saw that with Neil. I knew that just because his path wasn't the same as other people's, I knew he was pointed in the right direction and eventually he would get there. Yeah. For those listening, the the quote that she's referring to, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's by Kevin Worthen, who is the president of BYU. And it's a great quote. So we'll put that in the show notes, but I don't want to take any more time away from, from this conversation. So one thing that I have been impressed with in the way that you've told your story and expressed this experience is that you talked about the difference between real life intimacy and marriage and lust and how addiction is being fed through lust. Can you explain, Neil, why those two things are different? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, there's a lot that goes into that. But I think that that's one of that kind of feeds into that common myth that I think a lot of people share of like, hey, you know, once you get married, this is going to go away. You know, you're going to be able to be intimate with your wife and that, you know, that part will be fulfilled. Another myth, side note, is you're going to go on a mission and it's going to fix it. And that was one that I, you know, I, I did great. And then I came home and got back into it. But, but yeah, back to your question, lust is something that's very unnatural, so, I mean, a, a loose, this is a super loose definition of it, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but it's something along the lines of taking something that's that's normal or natural or good and then using it in a negative way to serve like a, a selfish purpose. So taking something like we, we have a lot of people who struggle with food addiction that come into ARP meetings. And so food's not bad. Food's good. You need food. We, we use food, but it's, it's the way that that they'll speak to it and how it's become pro- problematic for them it 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 sounds the exact same i mean you could insert pornography or drugs or whatever and it sounds the exact same they're mm-hmm. like man i get so stressed out and i'm frustrated i'm irritable i'm restless i'm discontent and i just go to this thing and i just start you know i start eating a bunch of food or i eat a bunch of this and then i feel horrible afterwards i feel shame so it's the food's not the problem it's it's the behaviors. It's what you're using it for. Mm-hmm. So with with intimacy and with sexuality and these things, like obviously that's God get that's God given. Heavenly Father gave those this this power to us for a very important cause and to central to His plan. So there's nothing wrong with it with intimacy, but lust is something where I figured out at an early age for me that. Once I made that connection of like, okay, these feelings like are, this is different. This is, is shame driven. It's, it's objectification. It's all of these different things. Like it was a whole different feeling. It was, it was lust. It was something that was very different. And it wasn't until, you know, later on and you, you know, getting married and, and being able to express and, and have true intimacy when you're living the commandments, you're doing what's right and abstaining from you know, pornography and all these things, it's a completely different experience. It's about the individual. It's about connecting with with your spouse. It's about an expression of the commitment of your relationship and of your temple marriage. And and it's very connecting. And I, I think whereas lust is is disconnecting. It's it's isolation. It's it's shameful. It's, you know, driven by a bunch of negative emotions of fear of resentment. I mean, the underlying causes and conditions that drive you to, you know, to lust or, or shame, fear, guilt, resentment, all these negative things. So it's very negative. Whereas intimacy is very connecting, connecting mm-hmm. to a, a spouse and connecting to Heavenly Father. Lust is the opposite. It's very disconnecting. It's very isolating. Um, for myself, and then for uh, disconnecting me from God. Yeah. So on a spouse's side, too, I think that it's really important to understand. And for me, it was super helpful when I finally heard someone explain that pornography addiction or really any type of addiction is just pain management. There's such an opportunity as the spouse of a pornography addict to feel like it's really personal, like, oh, I'm not beautiful enough, or I'm not attractive enough or whatever, or like, I'm not fulfilling that. So he's finding it somewhere else when really it has nothing to do with that. It's I'm bored. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I'm anxious. I'm feeling stressed. And so I'm going to go to this quote unquote drug that Mm -hmm. I've gone to my whole life to numb out my feelings. And it's the same with any addiction with 
a drug addiction, with alcohol, with, like he said, even food. And that for me was very helpful to understand finally when I did catch on to that, that it wasn't about, oh, like our intimacy isn't good enough or he doesn't love me in that way. It actually has nothing to do with that and everything to do with someone who doesn't know how, this is kind of like an AA term, but people who don't live life on life's terms, they've never really felt a lot of the emotions that normal people feel because they just have been numbing them out for so many years that they don't even know how to deal with life in a normal way. It's just like more of a go-to to numb that out by looking at pornography or engaging in any other type of addiction. Yeah. So obviously, hopefully people can hear as you've been talking how passionate the two of you are about the addiction recovery program. And I think it's so cool to have people that have been through it, talk about it and how it's helped them. And so why you had tried a bunch of different things Mm -hmm. before this. And you mentioned, Neil, that it was finally when you realized that you needed the atonement, that you were able to, to make strides in overcoming this. Why is the gospel helpful in addiction recovery? It's a great question. I mean, really, if you boil down the 12 steps, the 12 step program, it, it is the gospel. That's what I like to describe. I describe it as a tactical way of applying the atonement of Jesus Christ. If you look at the steps and what they're, it's a, it's the repentance process. It's faith, mm-hmm. repentance. It's, it's baptism or commitment, feeling the Holy Ghost again, um, and it's, it's very specific and sequential in applying the atonement of Jesus Christ. And, and what I love about ARP is. ARP, because I'd been to a non-denominational 12-step meeting, which was great. And Mm -hmm. I I truly feel in my heart that the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were were inspired, were were very inspired by Heavenly Father to to create that. And and they got got that foundation. And Um, we still use those same 12 steps. They're printed in the ARP manual on the front page. And the church, yeah, the church adopted and, and um, with, with permission from Alcoholics Anonymous to, to use those 12 steps. So it's very, they're very much the same. They've added in Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. But for me, in attending a non-denominational 12-step meeting, I had that foundation, that background, but I couldn't connect the dots with the God, like the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ as I knew it. And it wasn't until we started going to these ARP meetings that there was a, a the facilitator and and the group leader of this meeting was old old a old time AA guy you know really rough around the edges from Philly yell at you you know <laughs> telling you like if that's what we needed I just needed somebody rough but he would he would connect it to the atonement of Jesus Christ because he's a, you know he's a member of the church and he was a convert and so he understood that part so he really was able to pull that together for me and I I was like wow this is the gospel in action. This is a tactical way of applying the atonement of Jesus Christ, where I recognize it's not me, it's God, and I need to get out of the way and and allow him to help me. And I need to be honest with myself. I need to be honest. The you know part of the steps in step five talks about going to see your bishop and and talking to them and 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 you know relating your wrongs. And then working through that process to repair the damage you've done and then going and serving others. So it really is, it, it is the gospel for me. And that's how I see it. Yeah. I'll never forget hearing Mandy Goobler talk about, um, she was talking about the addiction recovery program, but she didn't say that that's what she was talking about. Mm-hmm. And she just said, this is how to access the atonement of Jesus Christ. And then at the very end, she was like, these are the 12 steps. And I was like, wow, mind blown. But I think yes. that that's so powerful to recognize. It really is. Neil, you started to attend the meetings. And at this point, Corinne, were you attending with him or no? Not at first. We went to our very first ARP meeting together in Sandy. Okay. Um, it was just us and a, a senior couple. It was really awkward. <laughs> we read through the step of that. We read through the 12 steps. We read through the step of that week. And then they said, does anyone want to share? And I just looked at Neil like, oh. You're like, get me out of here. <laughs> he shared. I was like, hey, I've been and... used to going to meetings. So I'm like, yeah, what's up? My name is Neil. I'm an addict. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I shared, but it was very awkward. And But I felt the spirit there. That was really such a distinction for me because Neil had taken me once to like a, a weekend, like bring your family along kind of thing to his non-denominational 12-step group. 
And I just was like, this is not for me. Like, if this is for you, that's great. But they were like, people were in these shares, which I didn't even understand at the time, but it felt like a testimony meeting and people would stand up and they would say things like, like my sponsor saved me and the 12 steps saved me. And I just walked out of there and was like, this feels weird to me. But when we went to ARP, I felt the spirit. And it was because like Neil talked about a minute ago, it was the atonement of Jesus Christ and the 12 steps together. And it just felt right. And it made sense. But when we got to San Clemente and we moved from Utah to San Clemente five and a half years ago, and we first got down there, I was just super burned out of recovery. We had just been doing it for so many years. And I was like, you can do whatever you want, but I'm not going to meetings with you. I'm not paying for anything else. Just do whatever you want. Um, So he went for at least a year, I would say. And he started inviting me saying, I think you would really like these meetings. There's this really great couple that goes. And I think you would like the the wife and, you know, you should just come. And I was like, nope, not doing that. He probably had to invite me six or seven times before I finally was like, okay, you know, I'll it get. It was more than six or seven. Okay. It was, like well, it was a lot of times. So at this point, really quick, at this point, what was your marriage like? <sighs> Wasn't in a great spot. I mean, no. I I was trying. I was in recovery. I was attending meetings. I wasn't really working the program, and I, you know, I kind of, I just had a pattern of every six weeks or so, I could relapse. What what I would define as relapse or act out on my addiction, and then I'd be like, all right, you know, go talk to the bishop, then try again, and then you know. But months, most of the time, later, it was me finding out, not or she, yeah, she, she would find me. out, like kind of whittle it out of me, like, hey something's off, what's going on? And then I'm like, well, I've kind of been sketching out a little bit. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, well, actually, yeah, I'm, I totally relapsed. And I, I just wasn't honest with her. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, you know, different people do things a different way. But for myself, a lot of trial and error, I realized, I think where I finally get to get traction and, and, you know, we can speak to this a little later is when I finally recognized that I couldn't be sober and lie to my wife at the same time. It just created duality and I I couldn't, that dishonesty just weakened, I guess weakened me spiritually. So I couldn't, I just couldn't stay sober and and kind of live in a lie. But yeah, that's, that's kind of, our marriage wasn't great at that point. There there was a lot of challenges. We wanted it to be, but it just was like, we couldn't get out of the like cycles of like resentment and anger, frustration, you know, him trying, but then like slipping and then lying and then me being upset. And it just was like this like cycle that we just could not get out of. Yeah. And I know a lot of couples struggle with that where they feel like, gosh, I want a good marriage or I, we're going to church, we're paying our tithing, we're trying to do the right things, but like we just cannot figure out this problem. That's how it felt for us at that point. Yeah. So at what point did you start to notice a change? So Neil finally talked me into going to ARP with him and we went together for, I don't know, at least another year or so. Neither of us were doing the steps. I was really angry at first, just super resentful toward everything recovery. I looked at the meetings as like a bunch of addicts that sat around together and like pat each other on the back and was like, hey, like, you know what? Like you had a hard week, me too. It's okay. And I was just like, I am so over this. Like people being like rah, rah recovery. This is so awesome. So yeah, we went to the meetings together for probably, I don't know, at least a year or so. And Neil's last big relapse was super hard on me. That was conference weekend uh, two and a half years ago and in October. And I found out that he had been lying to me and it was, it just, I became, I was like undone by it. It was really, really upsetting to me. I had thought for several months he was doing great and I found out that he wasn't. And I called Mandy Goobler who ended up being my sponsor later, but she was the one that had introduced us to ARP. And I said, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I was just so upset and I didn't want to get divorced, but I just was like, I don't know how many more times I can, I describe it as feeling like somebody hit me with a semi truck and just laying in the middle of a highway. Like that's how it would feel every time I would find out that I had been lied to. And so she just listened to me for a minute. And then she said, are you calling me? because you need someone to listen to, or are you calling me because you want to do something about it? And I was like, I will do anything. And she said, okay, you need to do the steps. And so I started doing the steps for myself because I needed peace at whatever cost. And magically, just like it 
explains in the book Codependent No More, and just like anyone who understands how to overcome codependency, when you start taking care of yourself and you stop taking care of the addict, a lot of times they start taking care of their own problems because you're not sitting there trying to, you know, manage their addiction, manage their recovery. So I really, I don't know. I just kind of told Neil, I'm, I'm done doing this for you so you can do what you want. And that was a powerful moment for me because I think we'd, a lot of the time, I think I'd gotten to a point where, uh, like, I just kind of got into a weird space. There's there's the codependency thing. You're kind of doing that dance of back and forth of exchanging, you know, you're hurting me and and I'm resentful because you're checking up on me or all this stuff that comes out. And I think finally when that broke and I was like, first of all, I, I've recognized, I'm like, okay, I just, I don't have this at all. All this great knowledge, tens of thousands of dollars that we've paid. I've been going to these meetings for years. I'm just not getting it. I really feel like I'm like, I'm just terminally unique. I'm, I'm going to die this way. Like I, nothing, recovery doesn't work for me. Um, I've been to it. I've tried it. Nothing works. I'm just one of those cases that it's just not going to happen. I, and I, I kind of was really at a low point after that. And so finally, that's when I was like, all right, I will pick up this manual and I will just answer these questions and I'll, you know, study it. And then I'll talk to, uh, you know, there's a drug addict in the meeting that I really liked what he said. I was like, Hey man, can you sponsor me? So I started talking to him after I work a step and he kind of talked to me about the concepts and principles and helped me to apply it to my life. And so I just, I think at that point, I honestly started working the program. And when Corinne came to me and she said, you know what, you know, it wasn't vengefully or resent, you know, with resentment, it was just kind of like, Hey, whatever you do, I will be fine. I will be okay. I've got a connection with Heavenly Father. I'm good. It's all you. I think that moment, it was almost freeing to me and just to be like, wow, okay, I can no longer use my wife as as something that a reason to act out or like an excuse to engage in my addiction. I'm like, it's all me. If I sink or swim, it's all on me. And so at that point, I really was was engaging in in the program and working the steps. And I think just, I, th- I think I got I got 100% honest with myself and with with those around me at that point. Yeah. You've mentioned a few times sponsors. For those who are listening that may not be familiar, why is a sponsor important? What is a sponsor and why is it important? That's a great question. So a sponsor is somebody who's been through the steps, who's worked the steps and has recovery and is living them who then in the 12th step you share the message with others or or help others. And so they are somebody who you can kind of work with in the steps. The the manual, the ARP manual says a trusted advisor. In step five, it talks about it explicitly and says someone who, you know, you can share your experiences with that can can give you the feedback. Because a lot of times it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Like addiction for me and I think for a lot of people is all about lies and it's built on lying. So you lie to yourself first. So it's hard to tell what's what's real and what's not in trying to work out like, okay, where am I just lying to myself and totally in denial? But having somebody that's in a good spot that's worked through the steps who understands that and goes, I remember being like that. And I remember thinking and saying the exact same things, but who can look at it more objectively and say like, hey, man, you're lying to yourself and kind of call you out where needed. But also at the same time, say, hey, man, I understand where you're coming from. Like, that's super challenging. And I've been through that exact same thing. It's kind of, you know, the analogy of if you're going to climb Mount Everest, you want to go with someone who's climbed Mount Everest. You want a guide who's going to help you work through that and goes like, here's where you need to put your foot. We need Mm -hmm. ropes here, there. But you're the one who's got to do the footwork. Yeah. I think it's interesting that Morgan's asking us to because that isn't, the, the sponsor thing isn't something that every ARP group adopts. In the ARP culture where we live in South Orange County, California, we're very blessed because we have people who are have a really solid foundation of AA and that traditional 12-step program where you do chips to celebrate different lengths of sobriety. They're big on sponsorship where we live, where other places people don't really understand that or they haven't adopted that as much. But it is written right into the manual in several different places where it says, sit down with someone who's a trusted advisor in step five. When you do your fifth, when you read your fourth step inventory to someone, you're supposed to do it with your priesthood leader and with a trusted advisor who is a sponsor. And then I think it 
again. Eight and nine. Yeah, and eight and nine. You're and supposed you go to, to make amends with people. You, yeah. you want to kind of talk that through with someone who's a trust advisor or a sponsor. Wow. So we really feel like that's been such a blessing for us to have that as, you know, people, like Neil said in the beginning, this guy that kind of started this down in San Clemente, this really, really strong group of people who have then gone out and built other bigger meetings all throughout South Orange County. He was the original kind of guy that got that started in our area. And he's an old school AA guy. So he really believes in those chips. Super salty. Really believes in, yeah, um, doing the steps with the sponsor. And I think that that's something that we've watched so many people's lives change. Their marriages have come back together. Truly miracles happen right in front of our eyes because of ARP. and, And I think it's just an added bonus to us that we have that like AA culture that has also kind of shaped how people do the meetings in our area. Yeah. How AA started. I mean, the founders, you know, Dr. Bill, Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson, they were just two alcoholics and they, they found each other. They're trying to get recovery and they found what they found was there was some, something magical would happen when there was one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic that somehow communicating together that they've, they both found solution. They were both looking for help. And as they communicated and they were, were striving to, to recover that that's where the magic happened. And so that that's like a fundamental principle of the program. And that I find for myself is there's something magical, magical about two addicts talking to each other. It's almost like heavenly father steps in and through that communication, he gives both people what they need. And then at the end of the phone call, it's like, hey, man, thanks so much. You helped me. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. You totally helped me. And it's like this cool miracle. It's like the miracle of recovery. And that's kind of what the whole foundation is built on. So that's where I think sponsorship is so important with the program. Well, it reminds me of like our baptismal covenants, right? Like mourn with those that mourn. Absolutely. Like being there for each other is something we've covenanted not only to Heavenly Father, but to each other. Corinne, you did the 12 step program. You mentioned that and even had a sponsor, despite the fact that you are not the person struggling with addiction. Why would you recommend that to a spouse of an addict? And what advice would you give to someone who maybe wants to attend meetings, but they don't Mm -hmm. know how to like jump into that? So I think there's two different levels of people that come into ARP. I think there's the one that like you just got hit by the semi truck for the first time and you're like, how do I even, I'm, I'm in survival mode. I'm literally in the ICU of, of emotional catastrophe. And for those people, I think that going to the spouse and loved ones, the website and that manual is so helpful because it's just very loving. It's very gentle. It's very reassuring that this isn't your fault, that, you know, here's how to get comfort and peace from the Savior. Where I found that I needed something more was that my codependency of feeling like I needed to fix Neil and that I was never going to be happy so long as he was choosing to act out. It had taken over my life and I was just tired of feeling like I was a slave to that. I was imprisoned by whatever his choices were. And that's where Mandy just had some real talk with me and said, if you want this to change, you need to do something about it other than just complain about it. So, and that is a hard step for a lot of women that I work with that I meet in ARP meetings. It took me a long time to get there. It took me more than a year of going to meetings, maybe 18 months of going to meetings. And I went from being angry to kind of softening to just being at that moment of desperation where I was like, I don't know how many more relapses I can live through. And I needed I needed the Savior's atonement as bad as any other addict who just feels like I can't survive this one more day. And people talk a lot about that rock bottom of oh, some addicts need to hit rock bottom before they're willing to really like seek out the solution. And that's what happened to me where I just was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. And what I found in doing the 12 steps was that I needed Jesus just as much as everyone else did. And I found that peace for myself. I found that by working through my character weaknesses, by writing down all of the things that I had done wrong and then admitting them to someone else and asking God to take away my character weaknesses and making wrongs right for people who I've done things to or let down in the past— and then trying to stay in these maintenance steps that we talk about, 10, 11, 12, of 
trying to seek the Lord's will and have the power to carry it out and admit when I'm wrong as fast as I can and then just try to help and serve other people and share the message. Like living in those 10, 11, and 12 steps are the key to me feeling like I have peace no matter what. And people ask me all the time, like, well, what if Neil relapses again? Or what if he doesn't stay sober? And I no longer feel the desperation of like, oh my gosh, if that happens, then we won't be happy anymore. I won't know how to feel peace. I know exactly how to get that for myself. And that was such a um, an eye-opening thing doing each of the steps that, first of all, that there's no, like, I'm higher up than someone else who struggles with a different kind of addiction. It just brings you down to the depths of humility where you really have to look at all of your imperfections and character weaknesses and things you've done wrong. And you realize that we all need the Savior equally. We're all beggars. So that's a huge thing for me. And then just knowing too that no matter what happens in my life, I never need to feel that desperation of I don't have control or someone else is is controlling my happiness. I know that that's between me and the Savior. And I know how to access it too because of those 12 steps, because I live in those 10, 11, 12 maintenance steps. And because that's what drives everything we do in our lives. Neil, for those who aren't super familiar with the steps, Corinne mentioned 10, 11, 12 being huge for her. What step, is there a particular step that was influential for you? That's a good question. It's it's a hard question to answer because it's the it's the steps as a whole and worked sequentially. That's where the magic is. So mm. it's kind of like, you know, what part of the pre- repentance process is most important? It's like, well, repentance is that you just got to repent. Um, so, but there are things, there are concepts that took me longer and that I still have to come back to daily. I think if, if I really could describe the program in one word, it would be humility. Like it requires you have to be humble. It's impossible to work the 12 steps completely, thoroughly, and and truly and effectively without humility. So I think steps one, two, and three, they're one, two, and three for a reason. Basically, it's admitting that you're powerless over your addiction and then coming to believe that that the Savior and, and our Heavenly Father can restore you to spiritual health. And then in three, you allow them, you you turn your will over to God. And and that's the struggle because I think for if you're anything like me or an act like me, like that's just growing up. That was so hard for me is turning that over to God. Or maybe there's, you know, there's fears or different things that you experienced in your childhood or upbringing to where it's like, you know, that trust, maybe trusting in God is hard. It's difficult. Or maybe we have testimonies, but when difficult things come up, it's really hard to. So step three turning that over to God or kind of letting go and letting God. We talk a lot about the term surrender, which is basically surrendering to Jesus Christ. And kind of instead of if you're envisioning you're on this battlefield fighting this big, ugly monster and you got your little sword and you're poking at him. And instead of just, you know, trying to keep fighting, you just step back and set down the sword, put up your arms and be like, okay, I don't, I don't got this. This guy's going to destroy me. And then magically when, when I do that, like the savior steps in and just takes care of it. And so establishing that foundation of, of there's kind of a simple way that I, I, it's been explained to me in a meeting of step one, I can't step two, God can step three. So I'm going to let him. And that's just so powerful for me. And I have to, and that's really what surrender means to me. And I have to come back to that every day because a lot of times I want to take back my will and say like, no, God, I got it. I'm good. I, let me drive the bus. And then my life just starts squirreling out and I, I get, you know, it, it's harder and things don't come together. But when I let go and, and let Heavenly Father take the wheel, miracles happen. My life, you know, recovery happens. But that one, two, and three is kind of where that happens. Yeah. I feel like as you all talk, it's clear that this is something that you're actually grateful for, which is pretty amazing in light of all that you've been through. Why are you grateful for this experience and how has it changed you? That's a big question. I think for me, one of the things that was most important for me in my life was to marry the right person and for that relationship to go well. And I think at face value, looking at this being like, well, man, you kind of got, (laughs) you didn't get what you wanted. But I think on the contrary, I think I got exactly what I wanted. I think that because of 
the struggle because of the challenge that we've had and that my addiction has brought into my life, we have a relationship that is uniquely closer than it would have been had we not had this challenge. And I think that I've learned what it means, just get overwhelmed here, to utilize the atonement of Jesus Christ in your life and what that means. And, and when I get asked that temple question of, do you have a, a testimony of Jesus Christ? I always, I just tear up because that's something that I, that I know and, and truly feel and believe and, and, and have experienced. And that's because of, because of the addiction, um, ironically, but that's, that's kind of my answer to that question. Corinne. Thanks for, Thanks for that, starting. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm Morgan. I'm sure you've heard that quote by the man that is sits in the Sunday school class and starts hearing people talk about the handcart company and and they were critical of it. And he stood up and said, "This is what we endured, and this is what it looked like, and this was if this was the price, you know, that we had to pay to know." the Savior, I would do it again. And it was a privilege. I feel that same way about addiction. I used to just be so resentful when I would hear people in meetings say, I'm grateful for my addiction. I would be like, what is, A, what's wrong with you? And B, there's no way that you experienced what we've experienced it. And I now am totally that person that says in meetings, I'm so grateful that we've experienced this because I had to get to know Jesus in a way that I wouldn't know him if I hadn't gone through these steps. And if I didn't feel so desperate that I really was saying, I I will do anything to overcome this and to feel better and to find peace. And it was, it is grueling. It's, it's a grind. It's not easy to work the steps. And it took me about a year, but the miracle that I've seen in our relationship and in so many other people's, I think it's almost even more beautiful to see when you can help people find that joy and find that peace and really discover for themselves that it's it's so personal, like your relationship with our Savior is so personal. And I just don't know if I would get that in the way that I do if we hadn't experienced what we have here. And for that, I'm very grateful. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I feel bad because we have no tissues in here. I'm That's like okay. looking around. <laughs> it's fine. I'm um, good. Before we wrap up, we just have, well, actually, I just realized I have one more question here before our question that we always ask on this podcast. So I'll give you an opportunity to answer this just in case you have something you want to say. But my question would be, what would be your message for others who may be whose hearts may be aching as a result of addiction right now? That's a big one. I mean, first and foremost is I, I understand. I know how that feels. And I truly have felt that way where it's like, I I really felt like for a long time, I I mentioned the term terminally unique. Um, I'm different. Um, the, The atonement doesn't apply to me. These steps don't apply to me. I've tried it. I've tried it all. I'm just the way I am and I'm not going to be able to change and I'm going to die that way. That's a lie flat out. Um, if you're listening and, and you're in that spot, that's that's straight from the adversary, and that that's antichrist. Christ is the reason we can change, and Christ's power is bigger than any challenge that you have. Christ can overcome and will overcome any challenge that you have, and the the steps and and utilizing this program is the way that you can do that. That would be my message: is yeah. is that that it sounds very simple and we hear it every week in church or wherever but i think when you're faced with a big situation like that that's 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 just the truth yeah no i think that's powerful i think it's that idea that satan wants to get you by himself so then he can make you feel like you're defective you're alone absolutely so i think that's powerful corinne anything you'd add to that Yeah, I would say to the spouse of someone who is struggling with addiction that it can feel like a lot. It can feel like, I felt like for so many years I was a prisoner. Like I've said earlier, I was a prisoner to whatever Neil chose. If he wanted to be sober, then I could be happy. If he wanted to bring peace into our lives, then I could feel peaceful. But if not, I had no other choice. And when I did step three, which is the surrender step that Neil talked about, 
I literally physically felt Jesus Christ taking that burden from me. And I, I, it, it didn't happen until I was ready, but when I really was ready and I really said, okay, Heavenly Father, I'm going to do these steps and I want full credit for them. And he did it. He made that miracle happen and he took them away. And the other miracle that happened for me was when I did step six and seven and I asked Heavenly Father to take away that character weakness of always being angry at my husband for, like, I was always a little bit mad at him for what he had done. And there were certain events in our life and certain things that I felt like he took away from me that I was never going to get back. And every time I would get mad at him, those things would come up. And I, it was like, I was mad at him for everything. And it was a miracle to me that when I did those steps six and seven thoroughly, that that God took that away. And I love him in a way, not only, you know, I think you feel like when you first get married, like, oh, it's so blissful and so wonderful. And it's never going to be quite that good. Like, I love him in a way that that exceeds that, that goes beyond that, because um, I don't hold those resentments. Really, the atonement of Jesus Christ took that away for me when I did those steps. And I love him in a way that is so thorough and so deep, and that that would not have happened had I not done these steps. So my message to someone who's feeling desperate and feeling like it's never going to get better is it's hard, but do the work, do the steps, get to a meeting find somebody else who's done them and have them help you walk you through it. I mean, that's, that's it. That's where the solution really is. You don't need to pay for it. You don't need to have somebody else. You don't need to sit and spend thousands of dollars. You just need to get to a meeting because I love that somebody shared in a meeting once everything you need in this life is free. You can get baptized for free. You can get married in the temple for free and you can get sober for free or you can, you know, get that peace back in your life and love your husband again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Last question for you all is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think for me, it really comes down to, I talked about surrender. So when I look at the, the roots of my addiction or have to do with ego and have to do with pride and self-seeking and the natural man. And I think for me to be all in, um, what it means is, is it comes back to that scripture, Mosiah 319, that, that being all in is laying, laying it down. The way up is down. It's kind of a, one of the paradoxes of recovery. We talk about that to get, to progress, to become more like our Heavenly Father, we must humble ourselves and, and surrender and allow Him to perform that miracle. And that's, you know, so many of the the challenges of life and in my life have come about because um, that's been the struggle and it continues to be a struggle, but I have answers and I have solution that enable me to do that on a daily basis. And all I got to do is, is use the atonement and do the simple things that the gospel and in the book of Mormon talk about. And that's how I can, can maintain that. So being all in is surrendering to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Corinne. I think that to me, being all in means keeping an eternal perspective in that, and not maybe in the way that I used to think of when we would hear that in Sunday school and hear people talk about it and think like, oh yeah, we just need to remember that someday we're going to see Heavenly Father and it's all going to be worth it. Not in that way, but in the way that when we do things that don't make sense, when we really do give our will to Heavenly Father, and sometimes it doesn't look the way we think it's going to look. That was a big thing when we decided to be open with this story. And that was for Neil, a way bigger sacrifice than for me. He sacrificed so much of his pride and his, you know, what people would think of him or whatever. But we did it because we wanted to help people. We did it because every time we went to the temple, we had such overwhelming feelings about like, you need to tell this story so you can help people. And to me, being all in the gospel of Jesus Christ means being willing to do whatever God wants you to do because it doesn't matter at all what people think on this in this life. It doesn't matter how the things that matter so much to the world, how you make your money or what, what appearance you have to the world. None of those things are going to matter when we die. And we've had some, you know, really tender experiences this year in our family where it's just brought that perspective right to the forefront of what really is going to matter when we die. And all that's going to matter is, did we keep 
the faith? Did we share it with others? Were we willing to do whatever Heavenly Father asked of us? And and I'm so proud of Neil for doing that and just, you know, feel like if we can just keep that perspective, then, you know, we'll make it eventually. Yeah. Well, I cannot thank both of you enough for taking the time to be here with us to share your experience. I just think that you're both amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us Morgan. on. Thank you. We are so grateful to Corinne and Neil Stoko for joining us. For this week's episode, we've really worked hard to create a list of resources on our show notes that may be helpful to you. This includes links to podcast episodes Corinne has done about addiction recovery and specifically about pornography, links to the church's resources on the topic, as well as other quotes and books that may be useful to you. You can find our show notes for the episode by visiting www www.ldsliving.com slash all in. Again, that's www.ldsliving.com slash all in. If you have found this episode to be helpful, please don't forget to leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcast. A huge thank you to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for making me sound okay, and thank you for listening. <laughs>